Okay, here we go. Here we go. Episode twelve. I don't. I, I don't know what you're gonna say about this movie. It's gonna be interesting <laughs> to hear what you have to say. Yep. Uh, very, very much so. Very yeah. curious. This very unusual film. Yeah. Well, we just finished watching it twenty minutes ago. So. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see what you have it's to a say. A lot to digest in twenty minutes. A lot to digest. <laughs> Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of cinema, your master of fun and wonder, your existential Mr. Rogers. <laughs> you know, so many people lay so many names on me, I just, I can't even keep up. Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm with my lovely co-host... Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell. And what is this show, Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell? This is Elizabeth Views Whining About Movies. Which is all about Elizabeth's views on movies, and tonight I'm sure she's going to whine about the movie we're going to watch. <laughs> that, you're looking that we at that did camera. watch. That we did watch, just recently. Just 20 minutes ago. Moments ago, the three-hour <laughs> film. <laughs> yes. But before we get into all of that, we have to do our show's namesake. And pour up some wine. Yes, we do. And today... Pour it up. Uh, today, well, I'm going to pour it up. Today, uh, we have something we haven't drank before on this show. Right. We have a Merlot, ladies and gentlemen. This is, uh, again, from Naked Wines, who, by the way, are not sponsoring this show, although no. they probably should. They probably should. Tom Shula from uh, the North... Uh, where is this? The North, North Coast. North Coast. Where is there a North Coast in California? I guess that would be San Francisco and above. Uh, it is a Merlot... And um, what did you say about the alcohol content? 14.3. 14.3. It's up there. <laughs> so by the end of this show, we will be we'll be in good shape. Okay, I, just, I want to make sure. Elizabeth's always like, are you pouring me the right amount of, uh, of wine? I just want to say, here's here's how we start. Oh. Okay, now, now I just want to prove to you that I, I'm pouring my glass of wine. There's no magic involved. This is no Penn and Teller, David Copperfield shit. I think we need to start weighing the okay, glasses. Okay, there we go. I, I'd say that's pretty close. Would you not? See that, like, pretty close. <laughs> All right? She always thinks I'm, like, you know, trying to put a little too much in my glass. Well, tonight's movie is a highly unusual film. Yes. And um, it's Federico Fellini, his masterpiece, yes. La Dolce Vita, or The Sweet Life, The Good Life, the 1960 film. Uh, people have talked about this, puzzled over this. But before we get into it... Oh, yeah. We have to taste our wine. We do. Well, I was going to say we're going to cheers to Federico Fellini and our okay. and our, and our movie. So cheers to The Sweet Life. The Sweet Life. Mm. First of all. Mm. What do you think? It's not bad. <clears throat> I'm not a huge Merlot fan, but... Mm, I enjoy it. This is not bad. It's tangy. Mm -hmm. It's got a little bit of a bite. A little chalky. Chalky, chalky. That's that's not good. No, chalky doesn't necessarily mean bad. I think it's pretty good. I like it. Now, before we get into the movie, we have a letter. Oh. We have another letter Great. from longtime imagination connoisseur. Do you want to read the letter? Or do you want? No, I don't have my glasses. Don't have your glasses. Well. We have a letter, and it's from uh, our man Jeffrey Mao, longtime imagination connoisseur and member of the Post Geek Singularity community. He has written a letter about our show and the movie Betty Blue. Mm -hmm. Hi, Rob and Elizabeth. I recently finished watching Betty Blue, and I wanted to give you some of my impressions of it. I'm not going to provide a complete review, but just touch on some of the things that you and Elizabeth mentioned during your episode of Elizaviews. Mm hmm. The main impression I got was similar to what you guys were discussing, and that is the film has a bit of, oh, I don't know, fancifulness. I wouldn't say fantasy per se. Much of the events of the film might be the product of Zorg's imagination as opposed to reality happening. Though, since it's a work of fiction, nothing in the film is actually real. But I think we all kind of get the idea. Much of the evidence centers around Betty herself. Since the film is, I guess, told from Zorg's perspe perspective, as she is never in a scene in the film without him. She might serve as a kind of muse to him, as she essentially gets him his book published. We never learn what the book is about, so it could very well be some kind of auto, semi-autobiographical story where he is the main character and he has a relationship with Betty. It's also not coincidental that as soon as their relationship essentially ends, he gets the call that a publisher has accepted his book. After he comes to accept that she is completely gone and won't recover, he ends it finally. No trace of her remains, so no one can say that he completely made her up. There are some things that point to the fancifulness of this film. 
You have Betty, who is the same age as Beatrice Dahl and turns 20 in the film, having a friend in Lisa, who seems older than she is. It's never mentioned how they are friends, but it doesn't seem likely that they're childhood or school friends. Also, we know nothing about Betty's family, where she's from, any kind of details about her past, other than that she possibly is a drug abuser. But we also see that Zorg uses drugs also, so maybe there's a connection there in terms of his kind of potential drug-fueled haze, creating an imaginary girlfriend for himself. Also, we have the weird yellow Mercedes that Zorg sees in his shop one day, then all of a sudden it's just sitting outside the piano shop and they just take it, with the owner nowhere in sight, no one asking anything about it. We also have a very weird encounter with the police on the steps of the church after Zorg chases Betty when she freaks out and punches the window. Zorg has blood on his shoes, which suggests that she bled a lot, but her hand is barely bloody when they get home. Much of the later drama of the film revolves around Betty, Betty thinking she's pregnant. Her fretting about her weight earlier on is an obvious foreshadowing of that when she shows Zorg her false positive test, which he doubts because she uses an IUD. The lens changes in the next shot. Zorg is preparing to deliver the piano with Bob on the logging truck. I wonder if the lens change was done by Benex to both capture the size of the truck in the entire frame, but also to symbolize Zorg's wider worldview now that he thinks he'll be a father. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Later, when they go celebrate in the country, the next bit of fancy occurs when he pulls an already lit birthday cake out of the Mercedes trunk. <laughs> sure, like the whole thing wouldn't have either gone out or burned down the cake within a few minutes of leaving home. You and Elizabeth did mention the white cat, and I don't know what the significance of the cat is, but that it does seem to have some meaning. Zorg sees the cat when he is inspired to start writing again. By the way, he has some proper damn neat handwriting to write so straight on blank paper, but then it looks like they adopted the cat later on. So definitely a lot of interesting things to take in with Betty Blue, a very French movie, but one that is more accessible than perhaps older examples from the country. I was also taken in by the cinematography, the long opening shot of them making love, and the overall color choices. The most unreal light that came into the piano shop floor when they went to Eddie's mom's wake was also quite amazing. Mm. I'm not sure whether you want to read this letter during Rob's observations or whining about movies. How about both? It's up to you. <laughs> I'm more concerned that the letter actually reaches you, as I'm not sure if my last letter did. Regards, Jeff. Uh, we do like getting letters here at Liz yes, Views, don't do. we? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. All right. So anybody who wants to write in, you can write down below at thebrunettework.net and send us letters. We love them. And yes, now, we do. now on to a very, very famous, very challenging, very amazing movie, Federico Fellini's 1960 La Dolce Vita. Now, this is a movie that even today people are puzzling over what it means. What's it about? Uh, on the surface, it's basically about Marcello, played by Marcello Mastroianni, one of the coolest actors who ever existed, ever in any film, anywhere. Yeah. And he plays a, a, a journalist and aspiring novelist named Marcello, who sort of, uh, he, 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 he hangs around with paparazzi and covers events, movie stars, parties, socialites, rich people... Living, well, La Dolce Vita, the sweet life. And yet, he's sort of above it all, sort of disaffected. He has a woman that loves him at home, who's kind of crazy. But then he, he, he's not, he's not uh, uh, above finding a beautiful heiress in a club and, and picking up a prostitute, going home to the prostitute's out, house, leaving her outside to make them coffee while he makes love in the prostitute's bed to his very, very wealthy heiress. And and the film, um, it, it 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 doesn't have a traditional narrative. Would you say? No, it doesn't. And I feel like the movie is more about <clears throat> his struggle with accepting where he is in life and trying to figure out what he wants out of life. And I feel like every scene is more about him trying to figure that out and kind of being disillusioned by this life of partying and the shallowness of all these people that he hangs out with and that he's following and then he kind of struggles with that and he becomes like he kind of lashes out at times and uh, I feel like the whole movie is basically about that his struggle well absolutely and the number seven there's basically seven scenes in this movie seven long scenes and the number seven looms large over this movie people have talked about it could mean uh, the seven days of creation, 
the <clears throat> seven deadly sins, uh, the seven sacraments, mm -hmm. and 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 that's kind of it. Has this the movie opens with this strange sort of surreal scene of a helicopter. And what's really cool, it's one of those helicopters that you saw in like every 60s movie, whether it was a spy movie mm. or like a World War II movie. I don't even know what helicopters those are. It's not a Huey. It's like a, it's like the pre-Huey Huey. And this one helicopter is bringing a, a statue of Jesus through Rome. And it opens carrying the statue through the, the ancient right. ruins of Rome and then kind of past the new Rome that's been built up post-World War II, which is kind of industrial and not as beautiful, and then into the center of Rome. And Marcello is in a chase copter with paparazzi, and he's sort of chasing. And, and these guys, their their prey is this statue of D Jesus, but they find some pretty girls on a roof, and they're not like, hey, you know, we'll catch up with this Jesus statue <laughs> later. And they peel off in their helicopter, and they're kind of looking down on these hot hot ladies that were ba sunbathing and they're like what's your number <laughs> you know and the girls know that it's very italian like you were saying there it's very italian it's so like, italian i mean the men <clears throat> the men in this movie are are they're dogs they're all dogs yeah and um <clears throat> also uh he has been described uh the character of marcello as being like a dante-esque character meaning he's going through the circles of of hell in in uh, like dante's inferno and that all, everybody that you're meeting are, are denizens of the underworld. That's one reading of this movie. But, like, you were getting frustrated as we were watching this movie. You're like, what is this movie about? Like, there's no yeah. there's no traditional narrative. And, and it's very... There's elements of surrealism in it, and it doesn't... It was frustrating, but the further you get along in the film, the more you understand that this is more about him trying to figure out his life and being you know disillusioned by the whole lifestyle that he's he's like he wants to be part of it but then it gets on his nerves and at one point he's like at his friend's house who actually has a life and has a family and seems Look to really to have a wonderful life and then and then he kills himself so like what does that even mean well it, yeah i mean it, it like well, who is content life is sweet i mean you have you have this the, uh, italy itself is very much a character in this in this movie and and you've got like um you're, you're obviously 1960 is is only 15 years away from the end of world war ii and you're dealing with this cafe sort of this decadent society that in a way in, in my mind sort of harks back to ancient rome i mean it starts out right, with okay. the ancient roman ruins you know and you're thinking about okay well rome was the the seat of power in the world at one time and and then it fell, you know, the Visigoths or whatever. And, and now this this new society is sort of, the cafe society has sort of crept up. And everybody's fabulous. And let's just go from party to party. Yeah, and it doesn't... everyone is superficial. And it's just about partying. And, right. And sleeping around. And, and, you know, he goes from woman to woman to woman. But I don't think And that... guys to guys to guys. But he's not gay. But he I certainly is. I don't think is... that he's happy about that. That's the whole problem. No. I mean, I, I mean look, this movie... Um, why I like this movie is there's a lot of movies, especially like I I Italian movies. Fellini was doing this, and then uh, Michelangelo Antonioni did his what I love his Ennui trilogy with La Notte, La Ventura, and the Eclipse. And there was a lot of this the the malaise of, of the, the the bourgeois and the, the whole, <clears throat> and you really get a lot of that. Now, what's really interesting, like I, I noticed when we were watching the movie, first of all, this movie is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It is gorgeous, and a lot of it was shot on sets. These they built like eighty something sets wow. for this movie. All these interior sets, but there's none of the sets feel like I'm always talking about verisimilitude. Yeah. But there's a scene where they go to the doctor's office, right. and it looks like it's shot like right in a parking garage where the 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 the, the, yeah, the door to the parking and then the garage door is there. To the the room, the hospital room is like right off the garage. Right, it's right off the garage, and it, it <laughs> looks cool on film, but you're like. Where what what kind yeah, of a where hospital are they? is this? And what there's like this? a nun in a or nurse in a big habit and which is very Fellini. I mean, you know, you Fellini went on and made Roma and Satyricon and and obviously Eight and a Half, one of the great movies of all time. And then you see our character of Marcello gets older as the film goes on. Like this movie might have taken place over twenty years because he gets oh, gray really? at the end of the movie. Well, yeah, oh, I didn't notice you, that. You know, and it's and then it ends with. This crazy creature on the beach, it sort of is bookended by the whole... Well, I kind of took, like, that that sea creature being dead was kind of like... He, he looks at it and he says, like, oh, it's looking at me. 
And right, like I, judging him. Yeah, I and it's it like, dead. Like it's dead, and he's like dead inside. Right, and this film has like Anouk Ami um, plays. Oh, what's her name? Uh, um, um, Magdalena, Madalena. I mean, and who he meets again. Yeah, right, and that was also a weird interaction the second time because she like says, oh, I don't like having serious conversations. And then she takes him into a room and goes into the other room and talks to him and says, oh, this is our serious conversation. And then asks him to marry her and then makes out with another guy. Well, I mean, that's the thing. And then you never see her again. I mean, I think it's compressing. You know, it, well, here's what I find interesting about this movie. And at the time... It, it was a period of time where a lot of these foreign films, and I feel like whether it was Fellini or Antonioni or Truffaut in France or Godard, there was a lot of the, this influx of, of European cinema in France, Italy, um, and France and Italy where, where, first of all, France and Italy, you could be, in my mind, you could be fabulous. I mean, you could be uh, culture, everything, uh, all the great art and all of great culture, I think Americans, we just believe, like I believe anyone with a British accent smarter than I am. I've always believed that. <laughs> it's but true. I've, but I've also believed that um, uh, all of the, the fabulous, cool people, everybody you want to be and well, everyone experience. Well, definitely, more, yeah, yeah. I mean, Fran they're, you know, they're Spain more, and France. More cultured. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're not they're not walking around in sweats and, and, no. and rollers in their oh, hair. The costumes. This movie won an Academy Award for costumes. Yeah, the costumes were beautiful. Uh, and everybody's fabulous, but it's like, uh, but but nobody does ennui like the Italians and the and the French. It's like, well, what do we have to do? Well, that's my French accent. You know, it's, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I just... Yeah, but same, same, same idea. And I, I don't, I don't know, I, you know, maybe there's American movies like this, but for, in my mind, only the Europeans could have made movies in this kind of a way. Yeah, I don't think this translates to American culture. Well, especially... I mean, we can understand it and look at it and, and glean something from it, but um, I don't think in America it's quite like that. Well, also, the the way this movie is done, Fellini was known, obviously, for his surrealism, and, and I just don't think this movie... In a way, this movie feels like an artifact lost in time. Like, yeah. watching it now, like, you were... You were kind of getting frustrated by this because at first, before you sort of allowed yourself to have the movie watch, you have to let this movie wash over. Yeah, you, you do. And honestly, the fact that we just watched it, I feel like if we had watched it last night, I would have been a little less frustrated because I would have time to ingest it and really think about the meaning. Right. Um, but because we just watched it and came in here, I was a little frustrated because I was like, okay, I got to really think about what what this means and. I need time for that, but I mean, I kind of, kind of feel like I got the gist of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it, you know, nowadays, you know, I'm always telling people to watch older movies, but this is a challenging watch. I yeah. mean, it's you it's definitely three hours long, and honestly, I feel like he could have told the story more succinctly. I feel like some of the scenes just kind of go on, and there's dialogue that's not really well, there's necessary. A, there's this one line he goes. Somebody says to Marcello, neorealism, do you think it's dead? You know, and I, I mean, already Fellini was commenting on the, the, the filmmaking of the time as well. As he's, there's biblical references and classical yeah. literature references. I mean, uh, um, the um, uh, Maurizio, his friend, the intellectual, we meet him playing Bach, you know, that's a caught and fugue. Da -da -da, right. Da -da -da, right. You know, and it, it's, and he ends up killing himself. <laughs> like, is it good to be? No matter how cultured you are, and no matter how, it doesn't mean you're not depressed, and you will take you won't take your own life. I mean, and, and I feel I, get, I just didn't get that part. Like, why, why? Well, because maybe because being an intellectual isn't all that. But it's not cracked only up did he kill be. himself, he killed his children. Uh, yes, he killed his children. He did. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like there's there is death in this movie. <laughs> you know, there's the the the. the, the but but again, I mean. I feel like what, whether it's symbolic or, I mean, I've been to parties that felt like being at this movie, <laughs> you know, it, 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 there, there are times in my younger days when, you know, you'd go to these, these parties, sometimes you'd be a little too drunk or a little too something else. And you'd be wandering through these parties and you'd, you'd wind up in these conversations with people that you didn't know, 
about crazy subject matter and and suddenly you get really engaged like what's going on and and you know like marcello when he meets um, Although i don't feel he ever had any deep conversations with anyone well no in fact i think that's what frustrates him and mm. there's even one scene where he he like uh treats a girl like she's an animal and rides her like a horse and then he puts feathers all over her. Oh, yeah, I mean, it was end. so demeaning. I was, and I felt like he was just venting his frustration at this life that he's living. Well, no, he absolutely was. Like, there's a scene there's, with his... There's no depth. Like, his it's father. It's all and, superficial. And he wants more depth. No, he does. But but he's also he's also perpetuating his... his he's also perpetuating that that sort of superficial nature in his life. I mean, he just, look, he gravitates toward the most fabulous woman in the world room. I mean, no matter who she is, whether... Right. Like, there's the great scene with uh, Anita Ekberg as Sylvia, the Swedish actress or the American actress, but she's Swedish, who has, like, fabulously large boobs, you know, and shows up on the plane, and even she's like, I'm not going to take my glasses off. Wait, let me go back into the plane to get my scarf. And, like, he has this really long, frustrating night. Like, she's not succumbing to his charms and leads right. him at the end into the Trevi Fountain. I think the famous he's, attracted, scene Fountain. he's attracted to crazy, and he's attracted to that. But yet, it doesn't fulfill him. He's attracted to it, but then he hates it. Like, same with his fiance. They have this huge fight, and he breaks up with her, says he never wants to see her again leaves her on the side of the road and then goes back in the morning to pick her up. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I again, I mean it's all full of symbolism and meaning or maybe it's just all now gobbledygook, you know, he we loves look at drama. it now. No, he he clearly loves he clearly <laughs> he loves, loves crazy drama. drama. Now, a lot of this movie and I I can't like right now I don't know all the people that that but it was based on real things. Like there's a scene where two young people have seen a vision of the Virgin Mary. Right. You know, and, and that was based on a real occurrence, and there's and and yet all these people, the, the Italian press, and then right. these pilgrims, and everybody shows up to see this vision of the Virgin Mary, and what does it all mean? And and even then, he's like the whole thing. He's just looking down, and you kind of feel his disdain. Like these people are all crazy. All of this is yeah. Sort he's of, attracted to that. No, but but he's still he's still he, he might be attracted to it, but he's like enough. Like I'm just cooler than. I'm cooler than cool. I'm beyond all of this. I don't need to. You're getting a little light there, dear. Yeah, I am. Fill me up. So I just want to make sure <clears throat> that you understand <laughs> that I would say, would you say that that's another full glass for you? Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, I just want to make sure that I'm not, Let's you know, sure. stopping. Well, no, because I wasn't even done with my full oh. glass. So, you know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, she was like, you don't give me enough wine. And I'm like, oh, okay. So... <clears throat> So then the question I have for you is, uh, did you like this film? <clears throat> I loved it and I hated it at the same time. Wow. And why is that? It frustrated me. Like I said, I, I was frustrated with it. I, I feel like the more I think about it, the more I will ingest it and, and understand it and come to appreciate it. Um, coming right off the film, it was a little frustrating. Um, I think tomorrow I would have a different opinion. Well, also I didn't prep you enough. Like I didn't, I didn't tell you about like you. If you're gonna look, I love this movie, and I think everybody should watch this film. But you have to understand that this movie does not have a traditional narrative. And I think one of the things that I've talked about on obviously Rob's observations, one of the things that frustrates me is, is I feel like movies like this and the Antonioni on Wee trilogy and a lot of Godard's movies, you know, like Jules and Jim or, or Truffaut's movies and Godard's movies, whether it's Breathless or Jules and Jim or, or things like that, they just they don't have a traditional narrative structure the way we're so used to right. now. I, I mean, and I, and I feel and that I'm okay with that. I guess yeah, maybe if you had told me that in the beginning, right, you, it you'd be been prepared. A easier, yeah, because I kept waiting for a story to begin. And it just never really... Oh, I left the Blu-ray inside. I have the Criterion Blu-ray of this, and I have to say, the, the, it was restored in 2010. The restoration is absolutely... It's black and white and widescreen. It's just stunning to it look at. It is beautiful. It really is a beautiful film. Mm -hmm. I mean, every shot is gorgeous, and the sets and the people, and it... it, it, it 
You know, I don't know if an Italy like the Italy depicted in this movie ever existed. I don't think so. I mean, there's one scene where they're looking out. A, I forget who he's with. Like, I think, no, he follows Sylvia up the stairs. Like, you, I guess she's in a church and they go way high up to the steeple. And she right. throws open the window and she's like, where is the blah, blah, blah? And, and Marcello's like, like, that's in Florence. <laughs> You know, like she doesn't. She's like, like everything in Italy is just in the same place. Like, you know, my mother once told me I've never been to Florence. My mother said to me that Florence is I've the been most beautiful. Well, she said it's the most beautiful city in the it's world. Beautiful. Yeah, and I just think it's so strange. And, and I, but I do think, in a way, even Americans like sometimes we think of Europe as just everything is in Europe. Like right. Europe is just there's a place called Europe. Like it's a country. <laughs> We're going to Europe. Where it's like Disneyland, there's Rome, there's Italy land, and France land, and British land, and because we don't, you know, Americans don't have, like, what? Culture? Not even half Oops. of our population, less than half of our population has passports. Yeah. So it's like Europe is 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 this thing, like, the Eiffel Tower, it's like in Vegas, right? It's like that, they have it, they have it. There. <laughs> right. You know, but, right. but. It's just like that in Paris. And, and it, 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 it's so funny because none of this movie, like, other than going to the Trevi Fountain, which popularized the Trevi Fountain. Right. It's not like this movie is going to the Colosseum necessarily. I mean, you're seeing in a way that an Italy that only exists for Italians. Like if I went to Italy, I could never find myself in this movie. Whereas, you know, oh, I don't think these places exist. I feel like it's just like a spot here that he filmed and a spot there and then and then made you believe that it's Rome. Well, they did film it in in Chinatsitsa, I can't pronounce it, studios. I mean, they did film it at the most famous studio in, in, in Rome. Okay. So, but yeah, I, I mean, other than the beginning, when you see those hella goes cool, there's, there's, the thing about this movie, though, is every shot, there's a scene at the beginning when they're bringing in the Jesus statue. Yeah. And there's this panning shot at where you see the shadow of the Jesus come across the street and these kids are running after yes. the helicopter <clears throat> and the camera pans and there's a building there uh like and, and you see it looks like a regular city street but then there's a white building and then the 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 shadow of the helicopter and the jesus goes up the side of the building and i'm like how long did that take to set that right. shot up like how many times did the helicopter over there like okay back to one you know all the kids had to like, run back and it's just it's aw it's so amazing like every single shot in this movie they use the, the the use of the widescreen frame it's like every single frame in this movie could be could be captured as a still and and you could publish it in a like Toshin could be like La Dolce Vita and publish a huge thick coffee table book of just every shot in the film I every so. shot in the movie is amazing yeah that's true and the actors are beautiful they are i mean all the 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 uh, Anita Ekberg and 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 Anukami and all these these very f and they they all look very you know they're Euro people. Oh, absolutely. Again, like for Americans, they don't look American. They're Euro people. Yeah, they don't look American. And that's all. what makes like Marcello Mastroianni is one of the coolest motherfuckers who ever lived. <laughs> and and you just look at him. He just look everywhere he goes. I, I imagine. I I mean, I would love to live a life where I just had a hundred linen suits in my closet and, and it was, everything was perfect and I have the perfect I mean it have to be a lot thinner but I would just walk around with awesome European you know Italian bespoke linen suits that were casual looking but awesome and it doesn't matter if I was bedraggled or sweaty or was in the Trevi fountain I would always look awesome yeah. and I kind of feel like Marcello Mastriani even when he's like sitting at a cafe trying to write his novel or something he just always looked great yeah that guy was slick slick he was slick. Did you like him? Did you find him attractive? He was extremely attractive and very charming. So he did it for you. But what a dick. Oh, really? But aren't <laughs> yeah. girls attracted to dicks? They are. Like, would you be attracted to him if he came up and was like, Ooh, Absolutely. How are you doing? That's more my French. <laughs> Pepe la I need to come up with some kind of a <laughs> false. So you would have, even though knowing he's like a dick. I mean, yeah, he, but that's not he the He was like a I... horn dog. That guy's trying to get yeah. into every girl's pants yeah, he meets. Yeah, totally. I mean, think, I would flirt a little bit with him, but I don't think I would. Do you think that guy that. was good in bed? Do you think he was a cunning linguist? No, those kind of guys are not good in bed. Really? How do you know? Because they're too suave. It's like they'd only want one thing, and they just want to satisfy satisfy themselves. But don't you think a guy like Marcello Mastroianni wants a woman walking away from him, going, "Oh my God," so she can tell her friends that dude, that dude really got me off. Maybe. 
You don't think so? No? Maybe? I don't know. I don't know, man. I want to believe that he is a fabulous lover, even though he's a dick. <laughs> because that's why he walks away, and that's why his fiance he can like leave her by the side of the road one night, and then the next day she's there for him. That is so messed up. See, that maybe that's what was so frustrating to me. I felt like he was such a dick. It made me mad. Okay, well, that's interesting. So why why did... But, you know, he's in the middle of this existential crisis. Journalism. Right. Journalism or literature. Still, like, what's he going to do? What's it going to be? Like, in, in Europe, like, everybody's worrying about their job or the, everybody in Europe wants to be an artist. It's like everybody in L.A., I'm a screenwriter. How should... I, I once saw a story, uh, a news story when I first moved here where there was a, a woman that would... She was going around and asking people, how's your screenplay coming? And every one of them said, oh, you know, pretty good. I'm kind of stuck on one part. <laughs> like, everybody was writing a screenplay. And I feel I'm not like, writing a screenplay. I know, but I'm just saying. I, but I feel in this movie, <laughs> everybody thinks they're some kind of a, an artist or an intellectual or they're judging artists and intellectuals and, you know. Well, those are the kind of people he hangs out with. Right. Well, that's true. That's all we're seeing. They, they, everyone is so superficial. Does anyone have a job in this movie? Right. I mean, they talk about, I'm an actress, I'm in town to make a movie, and, you know, do we right. see them they're making the movie? They're all actors, or they have lots of money. They inherited lots of yeah, money. Yeah, they inherited lot. They're Euro trash. <laughs> I mean, no offense to my European brethren, but, you know, you know what it's like. It's like going yeah, to... Yeah, they're bored. They don't... They just throw these elaborate parties. They have no depth, and... I don't know. Maybe that's what bugged me so much. But are were you attracted to that lifestyle at I all? I am not attracted to that at all. See, I kind of wanted to spend like a month in this movie. I kind of wanted to hang out with Marcello and just wander from party to party and and have, you know, existential discussions and meet <laughs> these there women. Weren't, there weren't existential discussions. Yeah, but I would have made them. Nobody was having a deep discussion. But that's okay for a month. <clears throat> just, I, I just want to be fabulous for a month. Like, hang out in Rome and wear those linen suits and go to these parties. Did you want to go to these parties at all? I mean, I like going to parties. I'm not sure about those parties. Mm. Well, at the end, he's, like, trying to make everybody have an orgy. You're going to make love with him, and you're going to make love with him. <laughs> and, and most of the guys at the party were gay, which was weird. You know, and then they go, they go, I mean, F uh, Fellini never shies away from the strange and the, I think Fellini was... He loved the absurdity of life. Like, he loved the, 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 uh, uh, how crazy. I think I, I would love to have been in, in Fellini's brain because I would, and this movie, if it was in color, would have been just this unbelievable sensual mm -hmm. technicolor. I, I mean, or maybe not. Maybe he would want it to keep it in black and white, even if he could have shot. I mean, he could have shot it in color, but he chose to shoot this in black and white. And I think it works really well. It for does. the period. I mean, it nobody, well. everybody, Truffaut and Antonioni and Godard, they were all working in that black and white. Yeah. But it was all this kind of modern, there's there's the, there's the ancient and the modern colliding with each other, kind yeah. of, and I love that. So, like, would you, would you recommend this movie to anybody? I would preface it before I would show this to somebody. No, how would you preface it? I don't know. Like, I'd have to think about it. Like, like I said. That's it. Just we, so you know, like, just you know, since you're always accusing me of getting one over on you. I mean, there you go. See, do I not do a good job pretty much? Yes. Okay. So there you go. She's <laughs> like, I only got one bottle of our glass of wine. No, you didn't. I don't talk like that. I, I know. I'm just, you know, <laughs> that was my accusatory tone. Yeah. Well, I don't talk shrilly like that. No, you never really talk shrilly. Well, sometimes. <laughs> But never at me, really. Oh. You don't talk shrilly at me. Maybe at Tallulah. Yeah, Tallulah. <laughs> so, so uh, what more can you say uh, uh, about this film? Would you be interested in seeing more movies around this period? I mean, there's not another movie like that. I mean, a kind of... Like, yeah, the... I would. I mean, like I said, I, I was frustrated today, but I, I feel like tomorrow I will have thought about it more and appreciated it more i feel like i want to watch uh, antonioni's la note right now the first movie of his <laughs> ennui trilogy that i dearly love but um uh yeah i feel like that that might have been kind of a Too anyway much over the top well you can't it, it, it look these movies are are not they don't they don't have uh, american movies compared to this Th these these are movies that require a whole different um 
attention span. I mean, it's it's very... They are very different. And, you and, need to bring something to these movies as opposed to letting the movie... I mean, right. you let... You, 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 the movie washes over you, but you have to put yourself, I feel even today more so than ever, that you have to prepare yourself mentally yeah, in order do. to watch this movie. And a lot of French films too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the this movie is entirely different because if you're expecting a traditional narrative structure and you know this movie does not follow Sid Field's screenplay. And and I think that a lot of filmmakers, there's a lot of American filmmakers, like I think Paul Thomas Anderson was probably influenced a lot by movies like this. Tarantino has watched a lot of, of movies like this. But I think most audiences, especially audiences that might watch this show, this is not in their wheelhouse. And I'm not saying they, they wouldn't understand it. I'm just saying that you you have to throw away what you know about traditional narrative in order to allow this movie to work. Otherwise, you'll like you, you'll be frustrated within a half an hour. You'll be like, what is this? Why am I watching this? Is well, that... I didn't exactly say why am I watching. No, this. no, no. I, I that was <clears throat> those are my words. I wasn't saying. I did feel frustrated because I was expecting like a narrative, a, a story of some sort. But then once I got past that, well, you know, there is a story here. It's just not a, a traditional. It's not a, a traditional narrative. Three act narrative. But once I got past that, and I really started to think about what he was feeling and going through and, and his experiences, then I, I kind of warmed up to it. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I mean, so you, you've got kind of, that, that, that's good to, good to know because I think once again, you had to get past it. You had to get like, yeah. you're waiting for this narrative to start and you're like, what's yeah. going on? I feel like I, I, I wish I had known a little bit more about it before I jumped in to watch it. Well, there is the internet. It's well, this newfangled yeah, but, thing. But you always uh, want me to go know, in true. without knowing anything You're about. Right. And I, I didn't. I mean, we, we've been so, so busy and doing all, all this stuff here at home. I should have prepped you more for it because being an artist, you know, you've been right. going, you've been studying film this year. Last year, you went, you took, took a film course. You actually made movies for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I should have just told you more about this. Now, um, having made films, now you've made films. You're a filmmaker. You've actually taken a film class and studied film theory. Are there any insights that you have into the this movie that you might not have had, say, a year ago before you... Is there anything you noticed about the filmmaking in this movie? Like, There's not a lot of continuity. If you're talking about editorial continuity and right. stuff like that, there's not a lot of that in this movie. There's a lot of, there's a lot of craziness. There's establishment. They don't... Geography. The, the, the... Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I wasn't thinking in terms of filmmaking because mm. it's already so much to wrap your head around that I wasn't thinking in terms of that. I did notice that it was beautiful and um, beautifully shot and the people were beautiful and the lighting was beautiful, uh, but I didn't think about the filmmaking part past that. Just because I was trying to grasp, like, what is the meaning of this film? Right. And also, you know, the 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 idea of having the the ennui of 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 this meaningless cafe culture, we don't have any of that anymore. You know, we just don't. Our culture is so it, it, it's almost like being on an alien planet. It really well, is. I kind of equate it to the American equivalence of like reality shows. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, because reality shows are like so superficial and I just, oh, I can't stand them. And so I just kind of felt like these parties were kind of on par with American reality shows. Right. Well, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, I think in American reality shows, like if there was a reality show where there were these kinds of fabulous people wearing right. these kinds of fabulous, it would be very clothes. different. Yeah, these kinds of fabulous. I, I feel like, I feel I like, still don't think I would watch like, it. Like watching the old Playboy After Dark. You know, Although where we did, we did watch that. Um, what was that one that where they got married after they met? Love is blind. <laughs> we actually watched that. That wasn't like this. No, no. These people never contemplated their existence. They were not worried about whether or not. They, their lives were too superficial. They were happy to be on TV. They're like, I'm on TV. Now, now that, that, that couple, the, uh, the um, Latino girl, that had the, she, the pretty girl that had the fiery personality that left him at the altar. But they, she wasn't Latino. What, no, she was from like Argentina, the South American girl. Oh. They just got signed by like CAA. 
What's CAA? The it's Creative Artist Agency or William Morris. <laughs> some big agency in town. The two of them, and then they eventually are back together. Yeah, they are back together. They're back together. They both got signed. So, hey, they win. <laughs> They're fabulous. But th I guess <laughs> they would be... That's that. very astute. They would be the people. They're the equivalent of who would be in this movie. But they wouldn't right. be dressed this well, and they wouldn't be at these fabulous parties, and they wouldn't be talking about whether I should be a journalist or an, uh, right. a, a man of, well, a, a no, man of letters. Well, no, it was different, like... The people in this film like were were rich and didn't have much to do except party. Um, let's we got we got uh, tips and we got people sending in chats and things. Uh, uh, well, this is a lot. We you know it's funny. I I was worried that we weren't you, you weren't wouldn't be loquacious on this movie, but you you have a I lot know, to say. You about. were like you were like kind I of was upset worried. with me. <clears throat> um, uh, Jason S sends in a tip and says if Disney uh, moved finished movies to streaming instead of the theater. How would it work if actors and producers were supposed to get box office points in the movie? I'm guessing zero from points. My quarantine movie recommendation is Dark City. Uh, Dark City was Alex Proyas' film that he made after The Crow. Dark City is amazing, and uh, you really need to watch, I guess, his version of it, where you don't. there's no explanation at the beginning, because I can't stand that there's an explanation at the beginning. They, boy, they didn't treat that movie w very well. Thank God for Roger Ebert doing the commentary and coming to its defense. Uh, Jason, good question. You're right. I think that contracts would... They would actually... I guess they would have to pay off. What Jason's asking, and the point that he's making, is that when you make a film, there are uh, box office earning bumps that everybody gets in their salaries the director the writer the actors if a movie makes a certain amount of money at the box office so they're gonna have to figure that out and that would be yeah i mean that's that's a really big issue <clears throat> and i don't know how they're gonna do it and, uh, so great question what is deep city dark city dark city oh oh it's you haven't seen dark city no oh it's so good uh, the less you know about that movie, the better. <laughs> is it that was a direct, Disney movie? It was no, oh. but it was direct. It came out a new line. It's a new line film, and it did you see the Crow? The movie The Crow with Brandon Lee. Yes. It, he, it's the movie he made after The Crow. It's got William Hurt, Jennifer Connelly. Oh. Uh, it's great, but the less you know about it, the better. Claudius is here. Our our, our one of our best supporters here. He makes you speak French. Bonjour, mon ami. <laughs> Un bon film. <laughs> This film feels very relevant to today. Fellini walks us through superficial decadence of Roman society. Note the peasants claw at the olive tree like the press yes. claw at the rich and famous. Yeah, there's so much symbolism in this movie. Yes. Whether it's biblical symbolism, whether it's <clears throat> symbolism about Italian history, or whether it's symbolism about celebrity. And I mean, it's, it, it is very... And, and I don't feel it's... Unless you decide to say the whole film's pretentious, I don't think it's pretentious. Mm. I think it's done very, very well. I think it's not pretentious like possession. Mm. I can't. Come on, man. <laughs> you might be right about that. I can't look. I can't. I can't say no. <clears throat> uh, Ian sends in a super chat and says, "Cheers! I had some Progresso chicken noodle tonight. Thanks <laughs> yeah. to Rob's suggestion." Mmm. <laughs> I'm telling you. Did you put it in a bowl? Please tell me you put it in a bowl because I hate that he eats it out of the pot. Yes, I. I what I do is I either take two or three cans and I'll put them in the pot and I add some sprinklings of garlic powder or a little bit of salt and uh, pepper as well and stir it all in. And then I just look, like I try to explain, Elizabeth, of course, half being half French, She's very much into enjoying the food and the presentation of the food. Well, the Yugoslavians, too. Like, you need to respect your food. You put it on a plate, you sit down, and you eat it with your family. I respect my food by eating it and, and just delighting no, it. No, that's not respect. Come on, man. You, you don't... eat it out of the pot. Well, the thing is, then you take it, you have it in a pot, and then you could just take the pot and eat it out of the pot. No one else is eating my soup. And so what's the difference if I then pour it into a nice bowl? Am I is is the is the does the soup know it's in a bowl? No, but you know that it's yes, in a bowl. Yes, but I kind of like I kind of like the idea oh that I'm, e I'm 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 eating it out of the pot. I like that. I can feel the <sighs> heat about it. It's a whole okay. So Ian, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Don Peters sends in a super chat and says uh, the movie relates on a Sartrean level. Otherwise, sucks. Uh, Sart Sartre, the the philosopher. Uh, what do you mean it sucks? Dan. Uh, I don't think, you know, saying a Fellini movie like La Dolce Vita that is 
is considered a, a bona fide classic of its of its time, and uh, <laughs> you, you can't just just say it sucks. Uh, I, I I think you're not you're not uh, you're not doing uh, Mr. Fellini proud. However, however, I will have to say that. Um, if that's how it struck you, that's not an invalid opinion. It's not an invalid opinion. I think it's an opinion a lot of people would share because we... But are afraid to say, because I feel like you're obligated to like this movie because it's some great movie. But you know what I think is important, though? You know, uh, tastes change. It's not like every painter painted the same painting every uh, throughout history. True. Every period of time has different... Like, again, I always talk about on Rob's observations that, like, I'm always railing, like, you kids today, you don't know about these movies. And I'm like, look, man, if you grew up in a world where you already had Jurassic Park, to go back and ask somebody to watch, say, a Godzilla movie of the 60s or a Harryhausen movie of stop motion animation like The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, if a kid's like, oh, uh, Uncle Bob, this 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 movie is old. It's old. It looks. I can't watch it. Let's watch it. No, the kid's not wrong. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that I agree that it, the movie sucks, but I I can understand that it's difficult to love this movie if you're not in that mindset. Right, and but also, our culture is very very different. Very different. I mean, it, 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 back in the day, what you, you know, you read about how if you lived in in some of the great cultural centers like New York City, you know, I, I I've read a lot of film criticism by and uh, 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 the critics of the '60s, the way they would wax rhapsodic about movies. It was, I mean, they would somebody would write a, a twenty page dissertation or a hundred page dissertation right. on this Same film. Same with art. Right. Exactly. Same. And I and I I just feel that we've lost their their. Popular culture has lost. There's no more highbrow popular culture. Yeah. You know, I, I feel I feel that 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 nowadays, it, 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 when somebody takes a picture of the Mona Lisa at the Louvre in their phone, I want to punch them in the face. <laughs> I'm I'm like I'm like you've missed the point. When somebody yeah. you know sees you too and they're holding up their phone, you know they're bullet the blue skies playing and they're like I'm gonna get this on my right. phone. You're like. You're in a fucking right. stadium. You're, not... You're feeling the edge. Like yes. we saw you too. We saw the Joshua Tree tour. I mean, when they were playing that, you know, yeah. and it's the... about the moment. And, and, yeah, and, and the edge is like, rah, yeah. rah, rah. and we were feeling those giant speakers, and, and the edge is like, you know, it's the bass, and we you could feel it. Yeah. You could stand up and feel the waves. Like, why? I would not want to be holding my phone up. No. And I feel our entire culture has been that way. It is. And it's a bummer. I, and I feel that relates to this movie. Like, he was surrounded by this superficial society. Well, yeah, he was. Like like ours now. Yeah. And and what's really interesting is nowadays, everybody thinks they're above everything. Like, like you, 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 you would never go into this movie going, well, you know, Federico Fellini knows a lot more about life than I do. So I'm going right. to sit down and I'm going to watch this movie and allow myself... To contemplate it, and 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 know that he's bringing me a vision that is unique to him, right? And I'm gonna experience his art. Now it's like, uh, okay, let's see what Fellini's got. Like he's got to entertain me, and and if he doesn't, uh, in the first five or ten minutes, I'm out. Yeah, that's true. Which is not ideal. Like you, you want to at least glean something from it. Yeah. Hey, Learn your mom's from... calling you. Should you take the call? No. Uh, but you, no, you're 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 you're, you're <laughs> right. I, I mean, me. I really do feel that way. I, I feel like, you know, like if you lived in New York of 1960 and this movie opened, it would be something that people would be talking about, like this right now. People, yeah. you go to parties and people would be contemplating this movie. They'd be discussing it. They'd be debating it because they know that Fellini has something to say. Yeah. Nowadays, everybody. Uh, it's easy to write things off immediately instead of trying to at least understand a part of it or or un try to understand like the the gist of something it's easy to just be like oh this is boring i'm not going to watch it right and i look i've always said i mean i i don't think that we're training i mean this movie was made it came out it came out in 1960 yeah and i feel that 
half the film going audience of the world today couldn't even um couldn't even watch this film mm. like they couldn't even get through it it's true and i kind of feel that's that's kind of a bummer that is a bummer i agree now by the way dan this is not this is not a slam on you personally no, I, no, i'm no. just cuz you brought up john paul sartre so that's okay he he brought up so so I that's that was a, a great observation. I didn't yeah, mean to. Yeah, I mean I have to admit that I was completely frustrated with this movie. Yeah, you were frustrated. Yeah, totally. Now, uh, uh, Dan continues on and says, two, what is total scope? Ah, what is total scope?" You may ask. Well, after the advent of television, uh, they had to come up with. They made movies bigger. Movies were shot originally at what, what is called the Academy Ratio, basically a square. Now, after that, they had they, movies became widescreen. And many different countries... I mean, Italy was a hub of filmmaking, as was France, as was Russia, as was Japan. And a lot of countries came up with different widescreen film processes. And this film was shot in total scope. Hmm. Total scope it was just a now I don't know the specs on what total scope is. I don't the aspect ratio it looked more than two to one. Well, uh uh let's see. What's what's pretty amazing is that hang on, I I let me let me go up here and uh I'm going to use this newfangled thing called the internet <laughs> total scope. And actually this is interesting. And find out Total scope film. Okay, film. Let's find out. Let's find out together, Dan. Uh, wow. D total scope, what is it? Total scope anamorphic lenses were manufactured in Italy. <laughs> well, we know that. Because, <laughs> uh, yes, they were. Uh, is it just another skin a cinemascope clone? Uh, another scam to mislead everyone? Uh, wow. Wow. Okay, you know what? Total scope apparently was another anamorphic lens. Now, how do anamorphic lenses work? What does anamorphic mean? An anamorphic lens, so you have a lens, right? Like this. What an anamor what anamorphic glass does is it distorts the image. It basically, because, uh, you know, a camera's got a lens like this, and what the glass does is it's distorted so the aspect ratio is it's very long like this but the glass is still the same size as many other lenses so the glass causes a distortion so it's filmed in a the same like a square I'm, this is a rudimentary thing but so the image is is distorted that's captured on the negative and what happens is when it's projected you have to have an anamorphic uh, a lens on the projector that will unstretch the image so even though it's it's all on the same size negative, the image is you know distorted, and so when it's projected, it's pulled out. So it was just a different form of anamorphic photography, I would imagine. Um, you know, you had a lot of things. Toho had Toho scope, so maybe they took total scope from Toho scope. Mm -hmm. um, when I I actually shot a short film. And it's the only thing I've ever worked on where it was truly anamorphic. I shot this short film for this girl. It's just a quick five-minute vampire short. And I used these old anamorphic lenses from the 50s, and they were they were amazing. And we were actually going to shoot... We did some experiments to shoot uh, uh, certain things. I've done experiments with, with other anamorphic lenses, because you can get them. And they're all, they all have different uh, drawbacks and different advantages. So... That's always pretty cool. Anyway, so Total Scope was, I guess, an Italian process. Hmm. Uh, Roberto Suarez uh, tips, he, our, our man up in Portland, says, I've been enjoying UFO and just realized that Jerry Anderson also was behind Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. That movie freaked me out as a kid. Have you ever seen it? Bruh. <laughs> Bruh. Roberto, <laughs> would it surprise you to know? That I have Journey to the Far Side of the Sun on Blu-ray. How many versions? Two, actually. I have oh two versions of God. Journey to the Far Side Only of the Sun. Only two! I know. <laughs> I know. 
Uh, so Journey to the Far Side of the Sun, Roberto is talking about, uh, it is a movie that Jerry Anderson, it's the only feature film Jerry Anderson, uh, produced Jerry Anderson of Thunderbirds fame, of UFO and Space Night, Space 1999 fame, or you can't really see it, but, you know, trust me. Um, it is a very interesting film about, um, I want to say it came out in 69, I think it did, because people have been asking me about this, but it's about, we find out that there's an, a duplicate Earth that is right on the other it's orbiting right on the sun around us and and it's about a, a mission to that duplicate earth to find out what's going on and it turns out that it's a little goofy that that duplicate earth is our mirror image but it's a really compelling really well done Ooh. science fiction film that sounds interesting. and yeah it's got Derek Meddings did a lot of the effects and it's it's very <clears throat> very cool and yes sir i've seen not only have i seen it i actually have an original window card a uh, window card for that movie, which is um, what they used to put in movie theaters. They haven't made them since the seventies, but I have an original, and it's terrible. It's got like an Apollo command module on it, which is nothing to anyway. That's you're like going what? Yeah, the, but uh, yes, Roberto. <laughs> uh, Claudia sends in another tip and says today Candida and I are drinking a red blend huh. from her native Dao region in Portugal. Ooh. Question: Steiner's suicide is the most tragic event in the film. What do you think Fellini is saying here? Maybe no one is safe from madness? Ooh. I want to hang out with oh. Claudius and Candida. That kind of makes sense. I was wondering that myself. Why did he kill himself? Maybe he was in some kind of an existential crisis. Yeah. I mean, the movie really is the existentialism of the bourgeoisie. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's sort of... Um, and, and he's shown as being... I mean, when we first meet him... He's playing the church organ. He's playing Bach. You know, he's 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 this cultured man who's supposedly somebody who is he represents rationality. Right. You know, he represents intellectualism. Yeah. And the fact and that maybe like you said, no one is is no one is is immune to madness. True. Like even the person that you think has got the most stable life and has, you know, what everyone's looking for he's the one who ends up killing himself and killing his children now did you feel i i felt obviously when he kills his kids it's really shocking it's like yeah wow it's one thing to kill yourself but to kill your children but but like it, it felt to me like now I, I can't imagine a more heinous act but in the context of this film it, it's just one more metaphorical thing on top it of is. another. It's like, a metaphor. Like, I didn't feel like if I was watching this on, say, Ozark season three and Wendy and Marty killed their kids, I'd be like, holy oh shit, what the hell? <laughs> but in this movie, I felt like I was like, yeah. oh, okay, I was like, maybe. Yeah, it definitely was a metaphor for of something. I'd have to think about it. Like I said. Well, do you think that, like, you know, the, the idea of the, the nuclear family having children and being a father... Like, that was sort of incongruous to the rest of the film. Like, that's not fabulous. It's fabulous right. to be an intellectual and be able it's, to it's bust stable. out the box. It's like, it's like a... Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're middle class. You're, you're suddenly, yeah, I'm part of the nuclear family, right. but I want to be part of this. I want to be part of the great cafe culture in Italy. Right. And, I, you, know, and you I can't don't... have kids when you're doing that. Right. Okay, and like he was, yes, and he was. It, it maybe that that schism drove him. I feel like he was torn between that, like wanting that and not wanting that, and wanting that. He was a really messed up guy. Well, clearly, clearly, and uh, I mean anybody who kills himself, <laughs> but even even that, it was like he's stepping out on his own terms, and it, 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 from I, I also remember. I mean, there are people that have interpreted, I said this, the, interpreted that this movie is set in the underworld. Mm. You know, that literally, like, that that think um, that Marcello's, he is a Dante-esque character. And, and maybe, Interesting. like, I've always believed, I, I, I've i been working on a, a screenplay that I'll one day I'll finish. But the idea that this is hell. You know, this, mm. we live in hell already. Because the idea of eternal damnation, I've always believed that, well, you'd get used to that. You know, eternal. What's happening today? Well, I'm eternally damned, so I'm going to feel the fires and the the pain of eternal hellfire. True. But after like a few thousand years, you're like, you'd be eh. desensitized. Yeah. So, but here, you never know when you're going to die. 
you know, every day you wonder, you're, you wonder what's going to happen. I mean, look at this. Oh, let's throw a global pandemic at everybody. So what's going to happen? Where are we going to be next week? I don't know. What's worse than waking up every day with that kind of insecurity? So maybe somebody like our intellectual character, even though he was a man of culture and all, none of that saved him. He still was like, well, what's going on in my life? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know what I do know? It's nine o'clock. Already. Our hour's up. Oh my goodness. So, uh, we have to, we've come to I'm almost to the, out of wine, too. Me, yeah, me too. We've come to the time where we have to give, we have our bottoms up scale, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen. Our bottoms up scale uh, of one glass, of, one glass of wine to four glasses of wine. Now, why do we, why do we have a scale of one to four glasses of wine? We have a scale from one to four because there are four glasses of wine in a bottle. And uh, as we so all know, four hang on. is the top score. Wait, let me uh, let me go this. And so, as just to show it, uh, we are drinking Tom Shula, and we're having a Merlot tonight on whining about movies. And yes, this is and we good. got I mean, this from how, Naked feel, Wines. Naked Wines, which oh, you can get. We have codes if you guys want to get six bottles for thirty five dollars. It's amazing that we are promoting something that we get nothing out of. Yeah, well, I haven't approached them yet, so. But we, uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, we paid them to get these wines. It's we not did, like, like, we did. But we're promoting. But it is fun. Like you get it's six. Super bottles. fun. Like who doesn't want to get six bottles? Plus you're supporting these vineyards, these these. Um, or so they say. Well, yeah, I believe it. I, uh, you know, but you know, when you get these bottles and it's still got the naked wine cork. Maybe Does if you're it part, really? yeah, yeah. Maybe if you're part of the naked wine thing, they give you the special corks, or maybe they just repackage it. You know. That's a cynic. No, you can't repackage. Wine. But I would say the wines are good. They're excellent. Yeah, the wines we've got from them are really, really good. Yes. So, even this Merlot. Even this Merlot, fantastic. It opened up, so you liked it. I did. It opened up well. It did. I thought I, I, I I'm quite enjoying it. Yes. So, okay, on our bottoms up scale, what is what is your uh, rating? One to four glasses of wine. How do you feel about La Dolce Vita? I will give this a three wine glass. Three three glasses of wine for yes. La Dolce Vita. You know, I'm I'm going to give it. Uh, th I'll give it three and a half stars because I, I believe that it, it is a film that has been left behind by time, and yet it's such an important movie. And and remember, I mean, this film is sixty years old now. So old, yet it's not that so old. It's the not whole sold. paparazzi culture that's still the same. It's still the same. I mean, there's still sixty years later. I mean, that's the thing. It's really it was inspired by the guy who created the man that the word paparazzi was right. was named after. So we didn't talk about that, but yeah. Yes. Mm. All right. Well, so that's a, a three and a half uh, glass of wine for me. Three for three you. Three from me. Three for you. No. Uh, did it make you interested to go delve deeper into Federico Fellini's filmography? Yes, it did, actually. We should watch Eight and a Half. Yes, I would be interested in watching that. No, yeah, we really should. Just, All right. just give me time to digest these films before I have to talk about them. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to bring an end to this episode of Whining About Movies. Yes. Uh, we don't know what the next whining about movies is going to be about. Oh, that's true. But today is Wednesday, so Friday night, two days from now, there's another whining about movies. If you like these shows, please hit like, please subscribe. Uh, if you have something that you want to add, send us a letter. We love letters. Or a video. Or a video. If you want to send or us both. video letters or both, uh, we will play them on the show. We will read your letters on this show. And uh, you can absolutely, as I take my glasses off, you can absolutely... Uh, contribute and i very much appreciate all the support whether it's through tips or super chats which we very much appreciate but also letters and you just being here and being a part of the show and and uh, as as uh davy 504 says smash like now and he's italian lamau so that slap would be like now so that's what i said oh did i, oh, did I say smash yeah well, i was like slapping the bass yeah i i didn't mean to say it sorry davy it is <laughs> it is he Stop doesn't like watch now. our show. He doesn't watch our show, but we watch his. Yeah, and do. he's Italian, so maybe he's a fan of Fellini's movies. Maybe. I think he would be. <clears throat> he might watch I our think show. Davey 504 kind of is a Fellini-esque character in himself. Yeah, he so. totally is. Totally is. Anyway, yeah. people are like, what? 
But anyway, so uh, 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 please come back. And uh, if you have suggestions, it, please visit the Whining About Movies Facebook page. Yes. Or the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page. I think the Richard is setting up a poll. The Richard is setting up a poll. You now can vote for movies that you want us to watch. And you know what? I mean, I, I started this, and the premise of the show was to show Elizabeth movies she's hadn't seen, or she'll pick movies or something. But even if we have seen it, we're going to watch a movie that you guys suggest. Yes, uh, that and you want to hear that, us talk about. Yeah, that you want to hear us talk about. So visit The Richard on the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page or the Whining About Movies Facebook page, and uh, we will we'll chat. Uh, we'll chat about movies that you suggest, right? Yeah, totally. I probably have them, or we you know, could stream them. We'll find them. We'll find them. So, but you know what? If you're gonna like throw out really obscure, that's fine. We'll try and find that. But yeah, but remember, it's whatever gets the most votes. Yeah, it's whatever gets the most votes. That's so. True. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have them. Maybe. Or we'll find them. We'll some find way. them. Well, so ladies and gentlemen, kind people, gentle souls from across the 28 known galaxies. We want to thank you for being here. And remember, every, Everyone, pers every person you meet what? has a story to tell that that you haven't heard. That's right. <laughs> and all, what, do you, what do you have to do? All you have to do is listen. All you have to do is listen. I got it right tonight. You got it right. Here's to you, babe. <laughs> My one last uh, swallow of wine. And with that, we bring Whining About Movies episode number 12 to a close. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, that's great. No, no, how, what, how do you say goodnight? Oh, have a better night. Have a better night. What's good? What's good? Wow, that was, you were very loquacious.